Good day, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar of well delivery process that will be instructed by engineer Abdullah Higazi. Before starting our webinar, we are just introduce our upcoming course of production optimization that will be seven days handless on experience workshop. The topics that will be discussed through our course are the noodle analysis, reservoir performance, wheel performance, perforation design, tubing size selection, wheel stimulation evaluation, artificial lift design, like the design of ESP and the design of gas lift. Also, network modeling, the IBR construction for horizontal wheels and water flood wheels. For the course package, it constitutes of lifetime access for recorded sessions, actual field data sets, application-based workshop, the course material will be provided, and also you will get a certificate with online identification. By the end of this course, you will be able to perform nodal analysis for your field and construct the IPR and the VLP, select the optimum size for tubing, determine the well lifetime cycle, evaluate stimulation jobs, select the optimum perforation gowns, optimize the artificial lifting selection, design, design ESP system and design gas lift system for your world. For the course fees, it's only $30 for students, and for working professionals, it's $50. Okay, if you are, if you want to register to our course, I will send, I will send the link for registration into, uh, into the Zoom chat now. So, if you want to enroll into our upcoming course that will be on 15 December for seven days you can register by the link that will be sent into the zoom chat okay now for our webinar the our instructor is, is engineer Abdullah Higazi Abdullah is a senior production technologist with 10 years of multi-discipline field experience in the will intervention completion and will delivery process. Also, he is working for Papetco Egypt company with current focus mainly on field of will intervention and will modeling and ESP system design. Thank you all for attending such interesting webinar and uh, for certificate, I will uh, send a link for the certification form into the Zoom chat. Uh, also, uh, also, so if you wanted to get a certificate for this webinar, you should fill into the, the form that will be sent soon into the Zoom chat. If you have any question, just type it into the Zoom chat. Thank you all, and Engineer Abdullah, you can start. Thank you for the uh, introduction. And uh, shall you please give me the share? I'll share my screen now. 
Yeah, so you can't read. Yeah. So uh, our session today will be about the well delivery process. And uh, our agenda for today uh, will be the discussing the origin and the importance of oil, exploring for oil and gas, uh, well types and rig types, well construction process, data acquisition, well completion, perforation, well testing, well intervention, artificial left, and finally the well abandonment. Uh, it's gonna be a quick view uh, in such uh, topics. Let me start with the uh, importance of oil. As we know, 84% uh, of crude oil is refined into fuel, while uh, it is not the only use of hydrocarbon for the fuel. It will be used in many industries like we see on the screen. So almost all the consumables that we use day by day are uh, originated or uh, contributed from uh, oil. Uh, so this is the importance of oil. What is the construction of oil? The chemical composition of oil will be composed of hydrocarbons, uh, which is hydrogen and uh, connected to uh, carbon atoms. The origin of the hydrocarbon, there is there is uh, two theories uh, for the origin of the hydrocarbon in organic theory and the organic theory and the organic theory is the most uh, common and supported one nowadays. The, in the inorganic hydrocarbon source uh, theory claims that there's chemical reaction that occurred naturally and these formed the uh, petroleum and uh, coal and this is not supported today. Uh, by the scientists. The organic theory states that the fossil fuels were formed from remains of plants and animals. And these plants and animals are microscopic uh, size uh, creatures, not like uh, some of us are um, uh, thinking as big creatures like dinosaurs. No, it's uh, small animals uh, or microscopic animals that had been buried and converted into the hydrocarbon with millions of years time by the catalytic action and the bacterial action along with heat and the pressure of burial. Why we support this one? Because the microscopic creatures are uh, existing with enough volume that can uh, that can form these big amounts of hydrocarbon. Moving through the crude oil composition, this is the common composition of most of crude oils. 84% of carbon, hydrogen 14% uh, percent and so on. The uh, exploration for the hydrocarbons are mainly searching for the oil traps. The oil traps and the uh, gas traps are uh, naturally formed structures that not allow the oil and gas to escape outside. So it consists of a reservoir rock and which is a permeable and porous rock and a cab rock, which is non-permeable, uh, which prevents the oil and gas from escaping upward by gravity. So. This is called a, 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 gra a trap. The oil trap and gas traps consist of reservoir rock and cab rock. The cab rock is impermeable rock and the reservoir rock is porous and permeable rock. The oil and gas exists in the uh, pores uh, naturally existing between the grains of the rock. These pores are defining the storage capacity of the rock and the pore, uh, this uh, pore size as a percentage of the total volume of the rock is called the porosity. So the porosity is the percentage of the pores inside the rock to the total volume of the rock. So the reservoir rock, as we stated, should have two properties. The first one is the porosity, 
which determine the storage capacity of the rock to the fluids and the hydrocarbon and the permeability which will allow the fluids to flow inside these rocks. The fluid flow inside any porous media will be controlled by the Darcy law, which relates the flow rate, which is here Q, to the porous media characteristics and the fluid properties. So the fluid flow rate inside the porous media will be determined by the permeability, which is a measure of the fluid uh, movement or the, 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 the rock ability to transmit the fluids. The mu, which is the viscosity of the fluid, the area of flow, the length of the uh, porous media, and the delta P across this one. As the delta P across the porous media increases, the flow rate will increase. So the flow happens from the high pressure to the low pressure. This equation, when converted to the radial flow equation, which is the case in the oil and gas production, is the Q, which is the flow rate, will equal to 2 multiplied by, by K, which is the permeability, H, which is the height of the reservoir or the producing interval, multiplied by the delta P between the reservoir pressure and the bottom hole flowing pressure, which is called here PW or PWF. This is all divided by the viscosity and the viscosity multiplied by len RE or R, which is the radius of the reservoir or the producing area, divided by RW, which is the radius of the well. So this is a dark C law corrected to the radial flow. This will give a linear relationship between the rate and the PW or the bottom hole flowing pressure. The K over mu is also called the mobility of the fluid and the reservoir. The mobility of the fluid in according to this reservoir, and this is with each parameter in the equation. What does it mean? So the very starting point of the oil industry is exploring for oil and gas. How we explore for oil and gas, we search for the traps, which is the structures commonly having hydrocarbon fluid. So the structures favorable for this oil and gas storage are detected by seismic data acquisition, sending seismic waves and reflecting and receiving them back to have this nice figure on what is beneath to uh, search for the oil and gas trap. Once a trap is detected, drilling is planned for this trap to explore if it is dry or having hydrocarbon. The types of oil will be divided into many categories. So the wells can be categorized according to the well trajectory, the vertical wells, which are the cheapest type of wells, the deviated wells, and the horizontal wells. The vertical wells, which are the cheapest, but not always applicable. Sometimes we need to drill under cities, shoreline drilling or connect multiple reservoirs, drill relief wells, or for a geological site track or operational site track from an original vertical hole, you will need to drill a deviated well. On the other hand, you sometimes require to drill a horizontal well into a reservoir to maximize the flow area and increase the contact between the reservoir and the well pool. Also connect multiple targets and the fractured reservoirs. On the other hand, according to well location, the wells may be classified into land wells and offshore wells. 
from the drilling purpose point of view, you can classify your wells into a wild cat well, exploration well, development well, and infill wells. And according to the float type, you may drill an oil well, gas well, water injector well, or a water source well to deliver water to this well injectors. These are the commonly used rig types to drill a well. Land rigs and offshore rigs are classified according to the depth of the water that it can drill through. The drill shafts, the semi-submersible rigs, the Jacob rigs, and the submersible rigs. According to the well purpose, the wildcat well is drilling into an unexplored area where there is unproven reserves or unproven potential for oil and gas, you drill for this potential detection. Exploratory wells will be based on the seismic data and you drill to target these traps where also there is unproven area of hydrocarbon production. Step out wells will be drilled or development wells will be drilled to delineate the reservoir boundaries and to know the extension of your hydrocarbon reservoir when you find something in an exploration well. The infill wells will be drilled between producing wells in order to accelerate the recovery from the reservoir and re-entry wells are old wells that is re-enter to deepen them, sidetrack them, rework or recomplete them. So inside the trap, the effect of density will be like this. The gas will be on top and underlying the gas will be the oil and on the bottom will be the water. For sure, this gas and oil Will not be capable to scale this trap because of the impermeable cap rock on top of the trap. For a developed reservoir, you may find an oil producer in the same reservoir and an injector that is injecting water to sweep and pressure up the oil inside the reservoir. This is normally a typical pattern for a developed reservoir where there is a water injection in the area. The rig components, which is the rig, is the equipment used to drill a well, and it is composed of several systems. The power system, which provides the power to the rig, the hoisting system, which is used to lift and uh, rotate uh, to lift the uh, drill pipe, the rotating system, which is used to rotate the pipes in order to and rotate the drill bit in order to the ground. The circulation system used to circulate the mud and the clean the cuttings from the pool, and the well control system in case of uncontrolled flow of hydrocarbon from the well. The well control system of the BOP will be used to control your well. The well construction process, how a well is drilled, you starting after placing your conductor pipe, you drill a surface hole, pumping, pumping some mud into the drill string and down to the drill bit to cool it, lift the cuttings outside the hole in order to drill ahead. This, the pressure of this mud or the hydrostatic pressure is normally higher than the reservoir pressure. In order to control the flow from this reservoir, you need a higher pressure in order to prevent this fluid from uncontrolled flow. So you drill ahead, clean your cuttings out, and run a casing. Your surface casing will protect your shallow water zone from the other zone and uh, prevent the unconsolidated 
zone from falling back into the well and fracturing to your run your casing, your metallic casing, and cement it into the ground. Then drill ahead with a smaller size bit into the ground, run another casing, cement it, drill more, and then this is last section, which is the production. This is the production section for the pay zone where you will set the liner or the sand face completion. After drilling this hole, you will require some data acquisition from the open hole. This data acquisition, in order to detect what you have found there, you need to log the hole. You have the open hole log, which is interpreted by the petrophysics into a log like this. Here, the color code, green is gas, and blue is water. We need also to collect some pressure and the mobility data by what is called MDT or RDT log is a kind of open hole log. So two main logs are carried out, the composite, the treble combo, uh, which you log your gamma ray, your uh, neutron density and velocity log, you, your resistivity will be uh, detected as well. The hydrocarbon will have high resistivity and on the opposite, the water will have low resistivity. This interpretation is carried out by the petrophysist and the data collection also for the pressure and the mobility, which is a K over mu, is collected by the RDT or the MDT. After collecting this data, you need to decide what you are going to do with this well. So for example, here, this is one well where we found gas, oil, and water, all the three, all the three phases are found in there in different reservoirs, and you need to decide where to complete your will on. A gas well, an oil well, or from the first block, looking at this interval, which is the water bearing interval. You may think you will never complete on it, but it is not the case and I'm gonna tell you why. According to the normal pressure theory, the normal pressure in a reservoir would tell you that when you go deeper, the pressure will be more but now this is not the case in here this pressure in this zone is 2000 however the normal pressure above it is 4000 meaning that this is depleted from somewhere maybe this well is down depth from an oil producing well on the same reservoir, and maybe the subsurface steam requires that you can treat the well as a water injector into this zone to sweep the oil into the producing zone, like we said in the beginning. So maybe this will find water here, but it will produce more oil by injecting into this well and the producing from the other one. So maybe the final decision to complete on the water zone even. Once we get this log, all the concerned parties should, should discuss together where to complete your well. And thinking about many factors, this is one of the most important decision-making steps in the well life. Is it gonna be gas, oil, or water? So completing the well as a gas will require that you have a gas processing facility in the nearby and also you need to study the effect of this well on the other well because it will increase the pressure in the system so you need to determine the potential of this well and the effect of this well on the other wells.
all completed on the oil. This oil zone, we need to decide whether it will be a naturally flowing or artificial lifted zone. This will be done by carrying out some sort of well modeling and nodal analysis, taking into consideration the fluid properties of this zone, which is detected from the offset wells, if any, you have the pressure, you have the mobility, and you can go ahead and produce your well, either by artificial lift or natural flow. What about completing on pause? You need to know if this gas will be aiding to lift this oil, or maybe this oil will kill this gas if the oil is heavy oil, maybe it will kill this gas and prevent the well from the flowing. If there is a great amount of pressure differential between the two, two zones, maybe perforating the two zones will let the oil cross flow into the gas zone. All this will be detected by the nodal analysis and the well modeling and to decide the optimum way to complete this well. And the optimum way always is completing bottoms up, from the bottom up, because isolating a zone above another target zone is not an easy job, especially where there is a little amount of spacing between both. So, this will have a variety of options to complete at, and each option will require its design. You have just decided which one you will complete at. You will decide then how to complete it. What will be the next step? The next step will be the will completion. The will completion refers to the method by which a newly drilled well can be finalized, finalized so that the reservoir fluids can be produced or the injection fluids can be injected into the well efficiently and safely. So in order to do so, there is two types of completion or two steps that you will divide your completion into. The sand phase completion, which is a lower completion, and the upper completion, which is the tubing or the artificial. Now, you will need to isolate each zone of these from each other. You will run either a casing from the bottom up to the surface and cement it, or run a liner, which is lower in cost and also have a higher clearance on the top of the well. So the upper part for a liner a well completed with a liner will be bigger and better from the accessibility point of view and less in cost. The liner will have less material used into the well, but taking into consideration that this piece of vibe is designed for the kind of completion that we will use. So running a liner, a cemented, liner or casing will require cementing it and perforating into the zone as well. You cemented your liner or casing, you will need to see if there is a good zonal isolation. Here is an example where two zones have been found inside the well, but there is no much cement isolation between both zones. This light color is a free pipe, meaning that it is a free of cement, and this dark color meaning there is good cement. How we evaluate the cement using the USIT? There is a variety of tools that can be used. The USIT is one of them, which is the ultrasonic imaging tool, sending some sort of ultrasonic waves and receiving them back, and the travel times will be used to detect whether there is a good cement or not. Now we have cemented, we have drilled our well, and cased and cemented it. We need to select the materials for our tubing, which is the flow conduit to our 
oil and gas. This is a normal tubing material selection chart where we use the H2S concentration and CO2 concentration to select one of these materials to use it in our tubing. The CO2 concentration is not used as a percentage, it should be used as a used as a partial pressure. The partial pressure is calculated by the concentration of your the concentration of your uh, gas. Here we need the concentration of CO2 and multiply it by our reservoir pressure to get the partial pressure and follow this flow chart in order to select our material. One more data acquisition is collected by the RDT, which is the downhole temperature, which is very important for the selection of the materials and selection of the perforation gun as well. Now the well is ready to produce, but not with this one. Here, the hydrocarbon has no path to follow to the surface because it is a cemented and cased as well. There is some metals and cement preventing these hydrocarbons to flow. What we will do then, we will perforate our casing and cement, creating a flow path from the casing, cement, and reservoir. If this pressure inside the reservoir is less than the hydrostatic pressure inside the well, the fluids will flow into the well. Otherwise, this is called the underbalance perforation. If the hydrostatic pressure inside the well is higher than the reservoir pressure, this is called overbalance perforation, and the fluid will not flow unless we bring the well into production. The well completion is then the point that will come next, how to select your upper completion. The upper completion will be selected. It is uh, the uh, design of the tubers that will conduct the fluids to the surface, whether the well will be naturally or artificially flowing, the design and installation of the completion accessories, and the installation of safety devices and equipment. The completion is successfully done if you achieve the target of the well by the lowest cost because there is always variety of completion option for each well. This is a variety of options that can be used for a lower completion or a sand face completion, a bare foot or an open hole completion, a pre-drilled or a slotted liner, cemented and perforated liner, open hole sand control with control screen and gravel back or case the whole gravel pack or refract back. This is a variety of options. We'll focus in here on this one. For the upper completion, there is a variety of options and either run a tubing less completion and the flow will be controlled by your Christmas tree as well, which is a set of valves used to control your flow into the flow line and to your processing facility. So a tubing less completion, a tubing completion without pucker, which doesn't provide a good isolation between the fluids and the casing and will lead to, if the fluids are corrosive, will lead to casing corrosion at last. Tubing completion with annulus pucker, which prevent the casing from direct contact from the producing fluids or a dual completion where you produce multiple zones by multiple tubing strings. This is a selective completion, another kind of completion where you have a, an SSD or a circulating device at isolated between two buckers and this zone can be produced by opening this 
circulating device and plugging running a wireline plug into the snippet or the bottom one can be produced by retrieving the plug and closing this one or both of them can be produced together by removing the plug and opening the circulating device. The well pressures is a very important term that you will need while dealing with your well by drilling or completion. The hydrostatic pressure is a pressure caused by any fluid coulomb. And this pressure, hydrostatic pressure is calculated by 0.052 multiplied by the fluid gravity in PBG or pound per gallon, multiplied by the TVD or the total vertical depth, not the along hole depth or the distance, it is the total vertical depth to get your hydrostatic pressure in the unit of PSI, you will need to use this equation with the mud weight or the fluid weight in PBG and the TVD in feet. Another pressure term is a pressure gradient, which is the pressure per unit length or unit height of your fluid just is got by removing this TVD from the equation because you divide the hydrostatic pressure by the length. So it is 0.052 multiplied by the weight of the fluid in PBG. The formation pressure is the fluid contained into the formation, the pressure of the fluids contained into this formation is called the formation pressure or the reservoir pressure and is normally equal to the fluid of a water, the pressure of a water column down to this depth. There are three terms under the reservoir or the formation flu fluid pressure three terms are nominated in here. The normal hydrostatic pressure is equal to the water fluid uh, pressure and the gradient of the formation fluid will be equal to the formation water fluid gradient, which is normally between 0.433 to 0.465. This is the normal hydrostatic pressure. The abnormal pressure, wherever you find the pressure of the reservoir above this value, it is abnormal pressure, which is caused by some geological events or by a man-created event, which is the water injection. So sometimes you are injecting into a zone and the drill another well, you find it uh, higher in pressure than the normal caused by this over injection and you take a kick. Subnormal formation fluid pressure is where you find your pressure. We just have seen a case for this where you found your reservoir is 2000 and you expect it is about 4000. This is called a subnormal formation pressure. The overburden pressure is the, the pressure exerted by the weight of the rock and the contained fluid over the interested zone. The fracture pressure is the pressure that causes the formation to fracture and the circulating fluid to be lost. And this term is used during the drilling, not overcome the fracture pressure while drilling and is used while doing a, a, a hydraulic fracturing to improve your reservoir performance and reservoir production. So perforating a well is just what we discussed to create a conduit between your reservoir fluids and your well and is done by a kind of lined and shaped charges. This would give you the best conduit shape and the deepest penetration. Lined and shaped charges can be used in a variety of ways, either to be Tubing conveyed perforation where your guns are conveyed into your final completion. You are ready for production, but you didn't perforate yet. You just perforate and drop your guns. This is called a T 
TCP shortened by perforation. And this is the most effective way to for a naturally producing well to produce the well once you perforate it, because once the gun is perforated and the drop, the well will start to produce straight away. Another technique is called TCP short and pull. You run your tubing, your uh, perforation gun into your tubing, you perforate pull and run the final completion, either it is ESP or another natural flow completion. And the most disadvantage of this technique that you need to kill the well that you created in the overbalanced state after perforating, which may create some troubles like formation damage into this reservoir. This is another technique, short and pull, short and drop, and through tubing perforation, where you convey your guns into an electric wire line and position your gun, then shoot whatever interval you need to shoot. Then if you are producing in the underbalance state, meaning that here there's some in bit empty uh, space into your tubing, making this hydrostatic pressure is less than the formation pressure of this one in order to allow the fluids to flow into the well bowl once it is perforated. That's why we have an empty volume in here. So you need to calculate it to have the hydrostatic pressure less than the reservoir pressure in order to produce your well, but the gun size will be less than the other one. This is the how it looks like the gun used to perforating into oil and gas wells. Then what comes next if the well flows, it flows, if it doesn't flow, there is a variety of options that will do. If it flows, we need to test it. That means that we need to detect the flow potential of the well for these hydrocarbons. Now we have an expectation after collecting the data of the RDT and the pressure data. We collected these data. We know the height from the log. We know everything. We model our well and we expect so that the well will produce a certain amount of fluids. Now we need to test our well to see the actual performance of the well. Testing a well will include a production testing or a pressure buildup testing. This will be done via uh, testing a separator, and we will collect surface data like the Q gas, which is the flow rate of the gas, the Q oil, the water cut, which is the percentage of the water to the total liquid, the PVT data, including the um, viscosity, the uh, API, gravity, and everything about the uh, fluids, the will hit flowing the pressures, and so on. Collecting these data, will you will match your well performance according to the expected data from the KH reservoir pressure and temperature that you have just modeled before perforating your well. You will use all these data to detect your well, performance before perforating and after perforating, you will match the data by the actual data. How you will measure your well uh, rates? You will use a kind of separator, which separate either a two-phase separator separates the gas from oil and from water, or just a two-phase separator separating the gas from the liquid, and then measuring the separated gas and the separated oil which is flowing from the well you will know your fluid flow capacity of the well the gas is measured by orifice meter where you co co you uh, are applying a constrained area and measure the differential pressure across this area so by this orifice meter you measure your gas rate and the fluid rate is measured by a turbine flow meter. You either, if it is a three phase, you measure the 
flow of oil, the flow of water. If it is a two phase, so you measure the total liquid and get a sample to detect how much water is existing in this liquid. For example, if the total liquid flow rate is 1000 barrel of liquid per day and you have 70% of it measured as water in the sample, you will apply this percentage to the flow rate. So you have 700 barrels of water and 300 barrels of oil. Then you may apply some kind of tests to match your model. The multi-rate test is choking back or closing the well partially in order to vary the flow rate and see what will be the well performance at different back pressure. This is vital to match your IPR performance. The drawdown test is used to flow your well for a long time and to uh, correlate the reservoir volume by the decline of the well rate with time, you will detect the amount of fluid that existing into your reservoir. The pressure buildup test is following a flowing test. You close the well and determine the pressure buildup inside this well post your flowing. So you produce some amount of some mass of your fluids and close the well to see how much the pressure has declined. You will determine your skin effect, your permeability, thickness multiplier. You will flow capacity and also you will detect the connected volume to your well by measuring the drop in pressure associated with producing a certain amount of fluids. The noodle analysis is the
عجنت Sorry for this uh, interruption, just a uh, bad network. Now uh, I'm back. I hope everybody is uh, hearing me back. Uh, so the uh, equation that describes the flow of fluid into the reservoir will be uh, called the IPR or the inflow performance relationship. And it is determined by the relationship between the bottom hole flowing pressure or the bottom hole pressure with the Q or the flow rate. And as this pressure increases, this will create more back pressure into the formation fluids and the flow into the reservoir will be uh, less because the differential pressure across the reservoir will be less. And as another system will be the uh, vertical lift performance or the uh, outflow performance relationship, which describes the relationship between the pressure in here and the rate inside the tube. This is determined by the hydrostatic pressure loss, the friction pressure loss, and the back pressure at the wheelhead from the other welds. So the intersection between both will be uh, will be uh, said to be the operating uh, point. This is where the pressure here is the same uh, for the IPR to flow and for the VLP. So the pressure in here will be as, as low as possible to produce from the reservoir at the certain rate and as high as possible to produce the fluids out because as the rate increases, the pressure required to lift them up increases. So that the uh, point. Okay, one um, important uh, uh, BBT characteristic of the fluid is a bubble point, as we have a mixture of oil and gas, or liquid and gas. As you decrease the pressure, the oil will start to expand. At one point, gas will start to release from this oil. This uh, pressure is called, uh, the pressure at this point is called the bubble point pressure. And to account for this pressure in the IPR, it will make some deflection in the IPR below this bubble point. So the Darcy law will not always apply for your flow. Otherwise, you will need to model your well below this Below this bubble point, you will need to use the Vogel correlation, which relate your Q max to the Q and PWF. PWF is a bottom hole flowing the pressure. PR is the reservoir pressure. And Q is your flow rate. So this is an example of a complicated network. And sometimes you put your well into the network and you get a net oil at the production facility less than before. So you put, you put a new well and you lose production. Why? Because each of these wells are creating back pressure to the other wells. Maybe you get a certain amount from this well and you lose higher amount from the other wells. As the pressure of the reservoir decreases, the IPR will start to be a parallel line to the old one, but with a less value of rate and the pressure. Okay, the point in here in the IPR is called the absolute open flow which is the maximum pressure, the maximum rate that the reservoir can deliver at a zero pack pressure in the bottom of the well or a zero PWF. So here is an example of a good well that can flow at a different tubing sets. If we complete with a tubing that will create this vertical lift performance, we will produce at this rate. If we run this tubing, which is a bigger tubing you will produce at this rate. So here is a perfect example of a natural producing. Well, as the reservoir pressure decreases, the IPR will shift down. With this tubing, it will not 
intersect meaning it will not produce and with this bigger tubing it will produce but with a lower amount here is an example the black one is the ipr for a well that have the same pressure but a less mobility as or a less quality a less productivity meaning that the maximum that this one can produce is much less than the maximum this one can produce. So the green one is a depleted high quality reservoir. The red one is a high pressure, high quality reservoir. And the black one is a high pressure, low quality reservoir. The intersection here is the reservoir pressure. The intersection here is the absolute open uh, flow. Wherever the IPR and VLP doesn't intersect, you will need some sort of intervention either to install artificial lift or to stimulate your well, meaning that you do a fracturing to your reservoir in order to create high permeability passes or you pump chemicals to create high permeability passes. The well intervention is any sort of operation that is done during the well life. It is a well servicing activity in a life well or a dead well. And this will be done to create some uh, job objective, either to remove flow obstruction, shut off water, repair mechanical failure, stimulate the well, increase production, or control the flow of oil, gas, and water, monitor your reservoir and collecting the pressure data, isolating some zone. And this well intervention is done either by wireline which is divided into slick line, braided line, electric line. The slick line is a single strand line that is done uh, that is uh, done to uh, perform some mechanical job into your well, and this has no electric connectivity with the downhole tools. This the tools will be lowered by this slick line. The wire line, electric line will be a surface read outline, the same concept as a slick line, but with the electric connectivity with your tools. The coil tubing is some sort of coiled length of thin walled tube that is lowered into a pressured well by means of mechanically driving belts and drums. This is how a coil tubing drop will look like. Now, assume that we have a producing well that has suddenly stopped the production, you will need action. You will need to check the wellhead back pressure from the well by checking your wellhead pressure and flow line pressure and so on to prove that the tubing is not plugged. You run slick line, dummy run, meaning that you lower a tool with the full gauge and see if it is pass, passing through the well or not. You well, if you find an obstruction, if it is salt, you can pump a fresh water to dissolve the salt. If it is acid soluble material, you can pump some acids with the cold tubing. If there is no obstruction, you will need to collect some data like lowering gauges to see, see what is your reservoir pressure, closing the well for a longer period and see what is the pressure in there? And if the pressure has declined from its initial, you may be also suffering from this stopping in the production due to water cut increase because a water is higher in gravity than the oil and will cause the oil to die. You may need to uh, do a coil tube lifting if the oil is loaded with high gravity liquids. And you may collect some data by a PLT. You may need to do a zonal change and add perforation or install some sort of artificial lift. Before installing artificial lift for a dead well, you need to run with a cold tube lift and test your well. So you will need to lower this pressure by bumping some nitrogen or some sort of gas and see if the well is producing back. If it is producing with a good rate, meaning that this is a lifting problem and the artificial lift will be helpful in here. 
and the kinds of artificial left here is an example of a well with a good productivity and a good pressure pressure is 5000 and the absolute open flow is above 11000 but the well will produce at a rate less than 1000 why because of the vertical lift and the outflow performance you need to install artificial lift in this well there is many sorts of artificial lift sucker root pumps gas lift progressive cavity pump and the electrical submersible pump the sucker root pump will have this surface unit that will be used to transmit the production the prime mover rotating power into a reciprocating power and this will be go up and down going down will open this traveling valve filling the tubing and in the upward stroke this valve will close shifting your fluids up and into the flow line so when you go down this one will open and the, the traveling one will open and the bottom one the standing valve will close allowing the fluids to fill this tubing and barrel and bump barrel and then you go up the traveling valve close and the standing valve open allowing your reservoir fluids into below the traveling valve and so on another sort of artificial lift is the esp pump consisting of a centrifugal pump a centrifugal pump multi-stage pump which is rotated by a motor and the motor is fed by electric power from a power cable there is a seal between the pump and motor in order to isolate the motor oil from the pump uh, fluid or the oil fluid not to burn the motor so the seal which is the blue one in here will isolate them and the accessories which we will not discuss in details the third type of artificial lift is a gas lift where the gas lift mandrels are here and you pump gas into the annulus between the tubing and the casing and this gas will enter the tubing lightening the gravity of the fluids inside the tubing and lifting your well bringing it back into production this is for the artificial lift the final stage of the well will be the well abandonment where if you have multiple zones you cannot leave them all open In order to abandon your well, when it reaches the economic limit and the well is producing less than the expenditure the company is providing, so you will need to isolate each zone from the other to not to damage your reservoirs by some sort of cross flow from water zones into gas and oil zone and so on. So in this process, the tubing is removed. The tubing is removed from the well and the section of well bore are filled with cement to isolate the two parts between the gas, water, and the oil. And the surface around the well head is then excavated and the well head and casing are cut and cab is welded in place and then buried. At this economic limit, there is often is still a significant amount of recoverable oil because you will not produce 100% of your uh, of your hydrocarbon in there, you will produce like uh, for the most optimistic case a 40% with all the enhanced oil recovery techniques. And in the theory of the abandonment of a well, the well should be ready for re entering and restoring if these economics are changed by increasing oil, oil. Uh, price or decreasing the expenditure needed to produce this well that's all from my side i hope you, you have enjoyed this uh, session and the uh, the mic is used uh, for any question
Thank you, Engineer Abdullah, for this interesting presentation. And uh, uh, we just have some questions into the, the Zoom chat, if you can answer. Yeah, I'll, I'll now uh, start to explore them. Yeah. Okay. okay. We may need well intervention to reduce near wheel bore pressure drop, which is where we usually see the largest drop due to mud invasion. Yes, this well intervention is a kind of stimulation that we have said either by fracturing or acid stimulation. The fracturing will apply higher pressure than the fracture pressure that we have just discussed, creating a flow pass into the reservoir and probing them with synthetic sand in order for this fracture not to close again during the production period. So it is some sort of full intervention used to in increase the productivity index of your uh, uh, reservoir. And the acid treatment will uh, help as well. Um, so, uh, I, uh, if you can read uh, this question for me, because uh, the, the internet, uh, uh, when it is uh, it went, uh, I lost uh, the old messages in the chat. So if you can, if you can uh, retype your questions, gents, would be great. شمانس لو لو تقدر تقدر لنا الأسئلة لأن هي مش موجودة عندي في لما طلعت من ال من السيشن فلو تقدر حضرتك تقرا لنا الأسئلة أو الناس تبعتها ممكن how can we reduce the effect of mud invasion that what we just discussed reperforating stimulation or acidizing how to maintain the formation pressure around borehole as every formation have different nature by injecting uh, injecting into your reservoir in another well you will maintain your reservoir uh, pressure uh, you maintain your reservoir pressure by uh, water injection and if you have different zones and one of them is below the bottom hole flowing pressure, it is start to take some of your flowing fluids. So you will need artificial lift to lower the pressure below the pressure of this uh, interval in order to produce them all. Any other questions, please uh, type them. Okay, seems that there's no more question. So is there any four phase separator? Uh, separator? Uh, so there's no four phases to separate four phases. So what we will normally have is uh, oil, gas, uh, and water. So that's why you use a three phase. But if you have solid the production, you will use a sand, a desander or a sand filter to uh, separate your solids before it enters the uh, separator, uh, causing some erosion uh, and a problem into your two or three phase separator. Is it possible to have a bubble point pressure as low as 300 PSI? Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, is it, it is possible and uh, existing as well where you have a heavy oil uh, you will have a low bubble point pressure because the gas will not dissolve, uh, will, will dissolve at lower pressure. Some reservoirs has as low as uh, 30 and, uh, and 50 PSI bubble point pressure. It uh, exists, but it will not have much gases as well. 
uh, this will depend on the composition uh, of both the uh, gas and oil and the properties of them as well. Uh, how about oil, water, gas, and sand? That is uh, I, uh, what I have just uh, answered uh, already. Uh, the sand will be uh, will be uh, uh, separated before it enters the separator uh, by sand filter or descent. The difference between gas lift and ESP for optimizations. So the ESP will. Uh, will introduce lower bottom hole pressure, especially for the, especially for the uh, deeper uh, wells, and uh, will be uh, 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 power consuming as well. The gas lift is always better where there is uh, higher pressure and where there is gas lift gas availability because you may be in an area where there is no gas in order to use the gas left. But uh, I was preparing some backup slides for the comparison, but uh, unfortunately the time didn't. So the fracture was proven and was acid. So the, the acid uh, fracturing uh, and uh, uh, refracturing with the proven are used is in different types of reservoirs. Uh, we normally, in my company, we use the fracture with proven. Uh, it is uh, less in cost, but the acid fracturing is used in the carbonate, mainly not in the sand. So we fracture with proven in the sand, uh, the sand reservoirs and with acid in the carbonate reservoirs in order to have a, a higher reach into the reservoir and dissolve the matrix itself. Okay, if there are no more questions, I would uh, thank you all and see you soon in another event, inshallah. Thank you all.